Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, Diane Mueller, your host, and um, the person behind most of the Commons efforts. And today, I'm really psyched. Um, we have been puttering around trying to figure out how to best expose the great minds that are part of the uh, Global Transformation Office and um, get some of their work around DevOps and community development and you know all kinds of things. Um, into our slipstream here. And today um, I'm really happy to have um, Jay Bloom from the GTO office. I have no idea what Jay, what your title actually is. Um, I think he just, we all just make them up at Red Hat is my theory. Um, but cool. Jabe and I have had a little bit of an ongoing conversation about community commons and I thought it would be great if we brought him in to have a conversation about um, and set the stage for it by having Jabe talk about his theories around the three uh, economies and commons and all those kinds of things. And then we'll do that probably for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on how long um, Jay rattles on. Um, and it's always entertaining and educational. Um, and then we're going to have sort of an AMA conversation. So if you have questions, you can ask them in Twitch if you're watching us in Twitch or in the Blue Jeans chat if you're watching us in Blue Jeans. And, um, and we'll, we'll wing it. So I'm going to let Jabe really introduce himself and then take it away for, you know, as long as it takes to set the stage for this. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for having me. Um, as, we, as we're about to discuss, the, the work of creating and sustaining a commons is, is a, um, it's a gift to a community. So thank you for your work um, establishing this and inviting me to participate in it. I appreciate it. Um, I'm Jay Bloom. Um, I work at the GTO, the Global Transformation Office, inside of Red Hat. Uh, my official title is Senior Director. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that means in relationship to the world, but that's my title. Um, I, uh, when I'm not um, Red Hatting um, and trying to help people through transformations, uh, I'm getting a PhD at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, some of the some of the work that I'm going to show you here uh, is is from my PhD, and um, what I kind of want to explore is just this idea of what what is a commons, and then uh, try to understand how um, enterprises could think of or engage in um, in commons or what I call recommoning. Um, and so, so in order to set that up, we kind of got to go through some, some theory to set up a, a, a place to talk about it, right? So first thing is just what is, what is the commons? What, what do we mean by a commons? So commons um, have kind of specific um, attributes. First of all, there's something like a common resource pool, and that means there's, there's things that people share um, and use together um, and that they get value out of, right? So... Uh, I'm just going to try not to use the word common to describe common things, but anyway. Um, so uh, a frequent example of the commons would be something like a fishery or a water source or a pasture land, right? Um, those types of commons are, are exposed to what is called subtractability, and, and all that means is that um, if people over-harvest the resources out of a commons, the value of the commons degrades quickly in the near term. So that basically means like if you fish too much, there'll be less fish for everybody um, and, and the quality of the fish goes down um, and therefore you got problems um, in the near term. And the result of that near term degradation of value um, is long term um, degradation of value because people are unwilling to invest um, themselves in um, sustaining something that's not providing them value. So the other thing to think about really quickly is that a commons is essentially established because the users are both consumers and contributors to the long-term sustainability of the commons. So they both, uh, everybody who's using a commons is both um, consuming from it um, and taking value from it, but also contributing it to it by not over harvesting it. So in other words, uh, restraint is a form of contribution in, in, in these types of commons. 
Um, so my, my friend Demeje, who um, is another PhD student, or was another PhD student, he's Dr. Uh, Demeje nowadays, um, wrote his, his dissertation on the concept of recombining. And he, he, he summarizes commons like this. Commons have been said to have a space between privately held property and public goods. And so it's, it's critical to kind of think of uh, commons uh, um, for a moment here that um, publicly held goods are things that are governed by governments, um, nation states, things like this. So like um, your, your local park is not a commons because it is, it is held and maintained and managed and governed by your city government. So it's not really a commons. Um, uh, that and private property, my backyard is not a commons. I own it. If I don't want you to be in it, I can ask you to leave, right? So a commons kind of lives in the space in between those two things. And one of the kind of important things about the idea of recommoning, which we'll get to, is that commons used to exist as, the, as kind of like just commonly held land. In other words, it wasn't held by the government. It wasn't held by individuals. It was just anybody could use it. And that, that was a thing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, they're not only, uh, uh, it, it, it's not only that resources uh, get consumed and overexploited, but also the idea of a commons is that there's a set of governance practices and communities that sustain the resources as they're used. So um, in this, conception, there's an idea that the commons is a form of commoning. In other words, there's an activity involved in creating and sustaining a commons. Uh, it's not just a set of resources. It's a set of practices, social practices and interactions um, that are um, that, that enable the commons to exist in the first place. Right. And so then we can kind of extend the idea of what's valuable about a commons to include things like social practices, knowledge, uh, shared space to work together, uh, governance, all of these kind of activities are part of what a commons is and add value uh, as well as just the physical goods that they produce. Um, and the other kind of thing is that commons is a interaction between what we would call local rationalities or what Herbert Simon would call a bounded rationality, which means roughly that um, the decisions you're making are contextually bound to a specific location, time, uh, uh, place, um, so that so that your decisions are not driven by universal rationalities or global rationalities, which are normally represented by the concept of homo economicus, which, which roughly says that there is some sort of universal way of rationalizing um, uh, economic decisions. So there's, there is a perfectly, um, uh, uh, a perfect way of calculating how to divide goods among people. That's a global rationality, right? So local versus global, so that what a commons exists in is, is in the intermediary between the values that are produced by paying attention to local concerns and the efficiencies and, and important rationalities that are represented by kind of global rationalities. So, so what's, what, what's the problem that we're kind of trying to point to here? We kind of described a thing. Is there, what's, what, what's the problem with the commons? How do, how do we kind of think through that um, so that we can talk about how to apply it and then, then, then solve the problem? So there's, there's two that I want to point out. The first one is just called the tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy of the commons is, is, is quite simple to understand. What it says is that <clears throat> given these two dominant rationalities, uh, individualistic, uh, private, uh, individualistic private concerns and local rationalities, versus communal global rationalities, uh, communal concerns, causes a, a, a collapse of the commons. And the way this works is that, imagine we have a, a, a cow field and anybody can graze their cows on the cow field. There's no local government that's putting regulations on the cow field. The way that the cow field is maintained as a commons is that everyone kind of knows that if there's too many cows on the f pasture, 
that uh, the pasture will be overgrazed and it will collapse. Um, and so uh, the problem with this is that if someone adopts kind of um, Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market uh, greed concept of interaction with this resource, what they will immediately decide is, because it's a zero-sum game, is they will decide that they should put as many cows on the pasture as possible, because if they're the only one who over populates the pasture, they will have more cows than everybody else and therefore they will get an advantage. Um, and if, there, if everybody puts too many cows on the pasture, well, nobody will have cows and therefore nobody will get an advantage. So one, in this kind of game theoretic, uh, one version of it produces I, I get more cows than everybody else and the other one produces nobody gets any more cows but I'm also not uh, I don't lose uh, in the game of kind of competitive tit tat, right? So that causes what's called the tragedy of commons. Um, it causes this idea that the commons cannot be self-sustaining. And in the original framing of this by a man named Hardin, um, he was trying to point out that commons are, are essentially unsustainable. Um, because these two rationalities cause the collapse of the commons at all times. And so there's going to be some interesting things we need to talk about, about why that is true or false. But the result of this kind of thinking led to what is called the enclosure movement in, in Europe, and especially in England. So the basic idea of the enclosure movement is roughly we have a bunch of common land um, that is uh, not being managed well because of these kind of cyclical collapses of the commons. And the theory becomes, well, the reason why the commons keeps on collapsing is because no one is personally responsible for maintaining the commons. Uh, so there's no either there's either no government structure that's governing the land or there's no individual who's personally responsible for the land. And so what they do is they basically carve up uh, all of England into little pieces. Um, they eradicate the commons. In other words, prior to the enclosure movement, there was land in England that was commonly held, not governmentally controlled, and not owned by individuals. People could hunt on it, graze on it, uh, Classic examples are like sheep herds uh, would, would traverse them, all those things. After the enclosure movement, every piece of land in England is either private property or public property. There is no longer commonly held property. Um, so this, this leads to what, they, what is called the tragedy of enclosure. So the tragedy of enclosure basically says that the problem with this is that you either lose uh, local uh, needs because you, you enclose the, the resource and give it to a government that doesn't care necessarily about the locality, local needs, or you destroy the global concerns by giving it to a private citizen, right? So you, you have this, you have a, a, by removing the commons, you have a tragedy that is, there is, there was there things that were valuable uh, in the commons that can only be held in common. They can't be held in these other two kind of economic rationalities. And that, that's one of the things to kind of uh, poke with. So. That, that's kind of commons theory really quickly. What, what does this have to do with IT and enterprise IT? Why, why am I ranting about this uh, in relationship to, um, to IT? So I, I, I think, um, I think uh, this should ring true for most people. Inside most organizations, we see a, 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 what we call a core conflict. And the core conflict is this. We see on one side of the organization a need or drive for radical accelerated differentiation of customer value. So this is the value system or the economic drivers of part of the organization are to create new novel functions, features, applications, business lines to address uh, expanding markets, new customers, new customer needs, right? So this is one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, we see in a lot of organizations a drive to centralize operational excellence and create efficiencies, right? So this is your central IT department in most organizations. And what we see is we get this kind of idea that there's a bunch of business lines, 
and they're almost always in conflict with a centralized IT organization. Yeah? And this conflict is what we kind of want to play with a little bit here. Um, so what we have is, is a paradox, and the paradox can be roughly kind of structured as uh, one side of the organization is arguing that we have to increase variety, and the other one is arguing that we have to decrease variation. Um, and, and these two economically, so both of those statements are about what creates value for the organization. One side of the organization argues that increasing variety, in other words, producing things that address new markets, new customer needs, adds value to the business. And the other side believes that decreasing variety by increasing um, the application of economics of scale, um, that is what creates um, value for the for the uh, business. So you can see that this causes kind of a direct problematic interaction, right? So what we get is, again, we get this idea that we've got business lines and product lines and business units with agile feature teams. And what they want to be governed by are concepts of autonomy, agility, and ownership, like product ownership, or you you write it, you run it, all these kind of conceptions of um, an organization where the, the teams are, uh, value is created for these teams by reducing dependencies. Let's say it that way. Huh? So that's one side of the, 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 the system. Uh, the other side of the system, of course, is interested in things like change control, governance risk and compliance, uh, approved reference architectures. Uh, they, they interact a lot with procurement to prevent people from purchasing non-standard non uh, technologies. Uh, they're very worried about things like availability, uh, reliability, things like this. And they are... Uh, hyper focused on kind of enforcing resource constraints in order to enable capacity planning right so these are the maybe two sides of the argument again and so what we have is these ideas that the value that they're trying to create again is more customers new markets do things differently versus control consumption use best practice and do the same things repeatedly right so these are the two governing theories um, and the result of this is that one side wants to be able to maximize the ability to respond to local variation and adapt to environmental change. And the other side wants to maximize the ability to harvest value from owned assets, things that the, the company has already developed and are running in operation, and the predictable nature of commodity goods, right? So what we look at here then is this idea of one side wanting to deploy what we would call local rationalities in order to create um, context-specific responses um, to, to uh, market stimuli. Um, and what, the focus is more on what's effective and what works. Um, and the whole idea is to develop unique resources uh, that solve customer needs and expand markets. On the other side, we have this idea of global rationalities, so we want people to leverage repeatable processes, we want to decrease variation, we have a hyper focus on efficiency as a source of value. Um, a lot of what we're doing is not, uh, we're not working with kind of unique rare resources, we're working with commodity and utility resources, um, things like, again, the cloud uh, might come in play here. Um, and the whole idea of this uh, ends up being that there's a difference between what we're designing for. We're on one side, the value that we're designing for is a customer's experience. And on the other side, we're designing to be able to maintain a system and lower the cost of change of that system. So um, this leads us to some interesting questions about um, what consumption is. Um, and in these different kind of areas, uh, uh, when we think about consumption, so again, uh, the whole point of a commons is that there are certain resources that are consumed. What we, what we see here is that um, the, the organization uh, that I'm labeled here, the differentiation part of the organization, um, relies on consumable publicly held resources in most organizations. And by publicly held, I mean centrally governed, right? Because on the other side, which I've labeled here as scale, these people are, are responsible for governing the consumable publicly held resources. So 
that's kind of ends up being the application of this paradox to uh, IT organizations today. So great, uh, we have a nice paradox. Um, now we might actually make some progress because paradoxes help us to think about things new uh, without accepting uh, um, old dogmas. So is there a, a way to think about this paradox differently? Um, is there a way of understanding um, how these two governing rationalities might be um, might be turned in from a uh, zero sum game to a win win game? How how would we how would we take these two ideas about how to govern an organization and instead of having one side always win and one side always lose, have a, have a way of thinking about this where both sides could win? Um, how would we do that? What would we look for? So the first thing to say, I think, um, is what what do we mean by consumable um, inside of an IT organization? What is consumable inside of a, a, an IT organization? And this has to do with this, again, this misbalance between the reproduction of a resource and the consumption of the resource. So it has to do with sustainable creation of certain things that are consumed, um, but specifically things that are consumed in a subtractable way. In other words, if they're overutilized, the value of them goes down, right? So I, I think clearly inside of IT organizations, this, this is things like network, storage, compute, and databases, right? Um, there's probably others, but these are four nice big ones. Um, so you can think about a network. A network is a thing uh, that is managed. There's a capacity to it. We manage the capacity by a capacity planning. If it gets oversaturated, the value of the network to everybody attached to that network goes down. Same thing with storage. It's possible to overrun the storage. Therefore, you have to plan for how much storage you want. Um, compute uh, is kind of a set of resources that are driven by certain other economics. Um, that are shared uh, in modern kind of uh, cloud-based, utility-based compute clusters. Um, they're shared resources. They're not, um, they're not private resources at that point. So this is, I think, uh, a set of things inside of an IT organization that is consumable. So you get a central IT organization that is built up to e and economically driven to govern the consumption and reproduction of these things, these kind of reliable primitives. And importantly, these, these resources, these types of resources like network, storage, and compute are not driven by the needs of any individual organization. Because they're commodities, they are driven by um, kind of global market pressures, not local market pressures of a particular business. So what I mean by that roughly is, uh, if you want to use a certain compute, um, it's like a certain CPU, that's great, uh, and you can invest in it, but next year, because of Moore's Law, um, you should probably replace it, because you're gonna be able to create um, more compute power at a lower cost or trade the uh, lower uh, compute, the lower heats uh, created by the new dyes uh, to create electricity efficiencies or air conditioning efficiencies. There's all sorts of trade-offs that are involved in choosing how you deploy the physical infrastructure of your compute. And those, um, those economics are not driven by any one firm's concern. They're driven by a large, um, uh, economic market uh, that 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 is out of control of any one firm, um, and therefore the people inside of this central IT organization are captive to certain economic cycles that that they cannot get out of. They they they. It doesn't matter how much the organization wants them to do things differently. Um, they they're they're trapped by it. Um, and you can imagine things like um, parts of the organization over, overly, um, becoming overly dependent on specific implementations of, for instance, storage or network or compute, and the result of that being that the organization's central IT department becomes handcuffed as to the cycle time of replacement for those things, and therefore the uh, efficiencies that they're expecting to get by following market efficiencies 
um, is reduced and problematic. So is there something inside of IT organizations that isn't consumed in use? Like, is there stuff inside of modern IT organizations that if more people use them, it doesn't go away, but it actually gains in value. So you can think of an idea of like, are there, is there stuff inside of an organization that if I get more and more people to use that stuff, it will become more and more valuable instead of less and less valuable, right? So a network becomes less and less valuable after a tipping point. Uh, is there stuff that doesn't have tipping points like that? And so I, I think these are like three big buckets of that. Uh, there's common data structures, there's well-factored functions, um, and there's patterns for configuring those, those and utilizing those primitives that I pointed to uh, that are managed by a centralized IT department. And the kind of value of the patterns is that they reduce the combinatorial complexity involved in integrating those various uh, primitives so that they create resilience. So one of the ways to think of that roughly is um, the, that centralized IT departments only ever provide reliable things, whereas the, this idea of getting people to use those reliable things in certain ways actually creates a resilient system. Um, and, and there's a difference uh, there that I think is important to point to. So now we get to this idea of three economies. This is, this is what I've kind of walked you through right now is the description of what are the three economies inside of an organization are. We have the economies of differentiation, the economies of scope, and the economies of scale. And what we can say is that starting from the economy of scale, economies of scale are responsible for the efficient uh, reproduction of these primitives, right? And then uh, uh, if we go to the other side, uh, different, economies of differentiation are, they create value by uh, creating differentiated functionality with rapid cycle times they're often highly disposable. This is kind of like the, your fail fast conceptions of the world. Um, and, they're, and they're often just uh, sets of pre-configured versions. Um, uh, so let, snap together Legos, so they, they stay really thin and move really fast, right? And then in the middle, in the middle is this new thing that I think we want to point at. And in the middle is this economy of scope. And in the economy of scope, we get these, um, these, uh, resources that are commonly held but actually increase in value in use and don't decrease in value in use. And again, that's things like cloud native patterns, common data structures, and common well-factored functions, right? Okay, so great. What's, what's the problem? Why doesn't everybody just build uh, these scope economies? Why don't, you know, that looks like a platform, I guess. Uh, why don't people just build platforms? And that, that, that'll solve all this, right? That's just build it and they will come. Um, so, but we know this isn't right. We know, based on a lot of practice inside of um, kind of software engineering, that kind of design for reuse up front or, uh, is going to hit you with the, the you're not going to need it hammer, right? Like eventually you're going to end up building too much stuff or you're going to build something and nobody's going to want it or build something and people won't need it. So I have some doubts uh, about building the platform first, right? So what, so what is what is it that we're kind of worried about here? What are we trying to get to? How, how do we how do we think through that problem, right? So Copeland um, does a nice job of saying, listen, you know, you don't have to design for reuse. On the other hand, you know, good design makes it easy to reuse. So one of the things I, I think that he's pointing at here is that there maybe this is like a sequence. There's a there's a way in which reuse doesn't come first, but it can come later. And how would you design or thinking about designing a system to allow that second, now it's reusable concept to kind of come into play? So why, why, why am I pointing at this? Well, again, we talked about this idea that differentiation has to do with lots of different customers with different needs, and those needs change. And when we're successful, we actually accelerate the change of those customers' needs. So what we can think about is that this kind of differentiation economy, we, we, we actually are able, only able to kind of create value by paying exquisite attention to the customers' 
needs. How the customer defines value is very important here. And the good news, I think, here is that it starts a flywheel um, that allows valuable things to be created inside of an organization and to be tested in inside of small safe to fail niches, right? So there's experiments that allow us to, you know, really um, experiment and play with an idea, and that only then, after we find a set of customers who value these things, then maybe we can look up and say, hey. Is there anybody else who might need this data that we just created? Is there anybody else who might need this function that we created, right? So, what is what is this thing that I that you guys all came here to talk uh, or listen to me rant about? This idea of recommoning. You've already heard of commons. You've heard now. You've heard of the three economies now. You've heard of like the paradox that we're trying to solve. But what what is what is this idea of recommoning? So. Recombining, I think, could be the most simplest way to say it is maybe some of the things that start in differentiation may eventually be more valuable in the economy of scope. So maybe some of the things that you create using the techniques of differentiation eventually need to be, let's say, promoted or, or converted or adopted or recommoned into um, this scope economy where the value of that unit now becomes the way in which other people can use it to achieve value for themselves, right? It's a shared common resource. And then the other side of it is maybe, maybe some of the things that we, because we currently don't have in most organization a concept of the scope economy. We don't have a way of thinking about shared resources. We only have a th way of thinking about like, uh, privately owned uh, differentiation economies logics or centrally owned scale logics. So maybe sometimes part of the friction that's caused between uh, the parts of the organization that want to create new value um, comes from when they give that thing, that, that new valuable thing, they give it to the scale economy, and the scale economy causes that um, enclosure problem, that, that the tragedy of enclosure. They don't actually leverage it well. They don't understand how to respond well. And so those things maybe, maybe some of the things that we currently attempt to rationally um, manage via centralized governance, maybe those things instead would be more valuable managed in a scope economy, in, inside of a kind of a platform system, right? So this may be what, what recommoning is. Maybe recommoning is the idea of taking things from these two other economies and putting them into a scope economy. So my, my friend Demetje literally wrote a book, uh, right, wrote his dissertation um, on uh, designing, uh, design-led recombining. So the whole idea here um, is is uh, driven by my interactions with, with Demetje, and I owe him a huge debt to some of these ideas. And he basically says that he makes this kind of platform part even more explicit, right? So maybe a platform could be conceptually understood as a, as a set of guiding principles uh, to uh, enable a two-sided market, in other words, the kind of private public market, to create and reveal a middle mass, an opportunity in which we could intervene and create better outcomes, um, and that th therefore platforms help us to recommon um, through new approaches to negotiating, right? So what would those negotiation looks like inside of an IT organization? Well, I think, one of them is simply to understand the nature of resources in somewhat like the way that I described them here, the way in which resources um, have different economic value in different economies. And therefore, um, some of those resources would be uh, more valuable if they were treated uh, or, or held in different rationalities or different economic rationalities or governance frames, right? So then, if we understood the nature of the resources and we could determine what type of economic rationality would be the optimal place to hold those different uh, resources, then we could start by working on establishing governance and social practices that enable us to transition these resources from one economy to, to, an, to the next. Now, I think that this is largely what 
uh, what many enterprise organizations are going through right now, what, what uh, they mean by transforming their organization is to understand we've been doing scale economy for 10 to 15 years. We've been doing agile now for anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Why isn't it working? What, why are we still having problems? And I think, I think that this is a proposal of why they're having problems and, and what we might have to change. So, Jabe, you're ranting about like social practices and governance and economics. Is there some examples um, of the importance of these things in practice? Like, can you, can you point at why, why I should listen to you? Can you give me some examples? So there's a book by Yoki Benkler. Benkler basically argues that Southwest, Toyota, Wikipedia, and Linux all share these ideas of reciprocity um, and the creation of cooperative, cooperative work systems in other words, the commons, um, as, as a way of thinking through um, how to create value for their businesses, um, and that those people um, are, a, are prime examples of people who are primarily motivated by, motivated by creating a common system and, and not motivated uh, by uh, kind of these other forms of rationality. So that, that's, that's Yoki Benkler's version of it. I think Jim Whitehurst's um, or, uh, argument that the, uh, about the open organization, particularly this, this concept that an open organization engages in participative communities, both inside and outside. Um, and what that does, again, is, is it, and what I think the three economies tries to explain is how, how do organizations who do that both respond to opportunities more quickly and leverage resources and talent inside and outside of their organizations more effectively. And, and I think that's uh, one of the arguments that you could point out. Um, and then finally, um, the idea of a platform and the idea of a commons, the way I want to tie these together is to suggest that, that these are kind of attractors, focal points inside of an organization that enable people to work together, to have a space and a place to work together um, to, create, um, to create value based on their local concerns while also negotiating their, their shared uh, and communal concerns. Um, and I think that organizations who learn to do this most effectively will, 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 ex will, will excel, right? Um, my, my very brief uh, kind of suggestion here would be Google's, Google's SRE uh, organization is, is an organization that is developing a commons. That's what they are doing. They're developing a set of regulations that are negotiated locally and enforced globally in order to create a common resource um, that uh, is highly resilient, right? So that's an example. So I think and I suspect that open source communities have something to tell us about how to do this. I think that open source communities, in fact, are well described by commons. Uh, um, and th they are capable of creating commons and, and thinking through uh, the social practices and governance needed to create a space to work together. I think that's a really good description of what we see when we look at open source. Um, but what, what if we, like, what, what could we, how could we think about that differently? What challenges might we think about that uh, differently uh, by saying like, instead of pointing at source commons, instead of pointing at the thing, the idea that, that what is the resource that we're creating that's commonly held is source code, in order to make the challenge something that causes us to rethink it, what lessons could we take from there and apply to something like a data commons, where, where the commonly held resource isn't source code, but data. How would we, how would we kind of think through that? Um, and what, what lessons would we take from the open source community in order to establish uh, a data commons inside of an enterprise? Because um, God knows no one has siloed data inside of organizations that's hard for other teams to use. Um, and maybe the, like, the simplest version of this talk is this idea about how can we make stone soup in the enterprise? How can we get people to contribute to the common plate? Um, 
and what is the how is the transformation from this or these organizations that are in conflict between two primary dominant rationalities how is the transformation started in a way that enables this third economy this scope economy or the commons to create a space to negotiate um, uh, value uh, and value creation uh, inside of our organizations. So um, my question is, um, what can the open source community teach us about recombining? Um, and that's, that's a question for you guys. So thank you for listening to me rant. Um, I have a, a lot of uh, resources and I'll make the slides available. I'm going to sit down now. Yeah, take a breath. Uh, thank you so much, Dave. And, and I love that you closed with Stone Soup because that is the book that I make every, I refer to so often um, when I'm talking about open source and community development. And it's, it's really, it's wonderful um, that you share that, uh, that image and, and that story with people as well. Um, I think what you've done is articulated a lot of things that um, that we use in Open OpenShift Commons that I've used to create the space that is OpenShift Commons and in some ways the platform that OpenShift Commons I hope is for our community that is around the ecosystem of OpenShift which is kind of why um, I really liked having you here today and invited you to do because I think one thing that um, often in open source we're very focused on the software you know the code the pieces and parts uh, of that and from a community point of view and um, so this conversation kind of opens us up to a, a bigger a higher level conversation that, yep. that I, I would like to continue with you with the openshift community um, and other communities that are you know part of that ecosystem which is huge we you, you and I have talked about um, what I call the jellyfish effect. Um, yep. All of the different people in the, the network of all the cross community collaborations that we do to um, bring people together, whether it's upstream, downstream projects, it's end users with different use cases. It's, it's a huge tangled mass of jellyfish that connect in different ways through their tentacles. That's the best metaphor I could find for what the OpenShift ecosystem actually looks like. And um, you, you talked about a lot of things here, and um, and I'm, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit too, because yeah. one of the things in the beginning of your 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 lecture talk, or what, however we want to frame that um, educational process that you dragged us through, which was wonderful, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the idea that um, for communities, um, you talked a lot about compute resources, networks, things, enterprise IT stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think the gatekeeping resource for a lot of um, communities and commons is people. Yeah. Right? So we can teach people agile, we can make people DevOps, we can you know, you know, shut off the waterfall or whatever we want to talk about. But um, for us, software is um, like if I write a piece of software, I share it as open source, it's infinitely reusable. It doesn't cost yeah. me anything to give people that software in a GitHub repo. But if yeah. I want to maintain it, um, get tech support on it, have engineering um, resources, um, debug stuff. Those are people. Um, yeah. And people have limited bandwidth. So, um, it, you know, how do, how do people fit into, as a resource, fit into this commons thing? I think that, that's one thing I'd like to tease out a little bit. And we could talk about what OpenShift yeah. Commons is in a little bit, but that was one of the things at the beginning. It's like it was very focused on, uh, I would say, tangible resources, even though sure, cloud is right, never yeah. considered tangible-ish. That's right. I think, so I think um, one of the things to think through, and we can think through it kind of at an at, at open source community level or even inside of an enterprise, one of the things to think about a, a, a scope economy view of an individual person, right? So like, um, what is, again, we have this idea of something's consumable, uh, inside that inside that individual human that that's their time uh, their life force <laughs> right um, their attention uh, all these things are consumable right they can't and and we get all sorts of interesting kind of theories about how to manage that limiting whip or project management centrally controlled versus individually controlled well, same types of things right 
But the scope economy wants to kind of, or the, the, the commons style economy wants to point us, I think, at a subtly different thing. And that's to say that, like, uh, how do, if I release something, what are the practices for rapidly establishing other people who share my concerns so that they will help me maintain it? Mm -hmm. How do I expose the common concerns of the thing that I'm putting in the world so that I accelerate the adoption of it, but also make clear that the value of it is a shared value? It's not uh, not something I'm going to manage. It's something we're going to manage, right? And, and I do think that, that in lots of organizations and in lots of communities, this is a difficult negotiation because the dominant concepts of governance are either – uh, you centrally control it, and therefore you have to go out and pay for resources, or you privately own it, in which case you do it and you have to sell it for value, right? Mm -hmm. and, and one of the weird kind of things that I didn't put in here, but I would I would kind of point at is that a lot of that um, negotiation about value as an individual has to do with the difference between what's called transactional relationships and reciprocity relationships. And so a tra transactional relationship is really easy. It is either central centralized group that's governing or a, a private held group. And every time you do something, you think of it as an individual transaction with that group. I, I'm going to do something, and I'm going to get value immediately from it or not. But it's a, it, when I'm done with this interaction, uh, we start anew, right? So that's kind of like traditional. And, and the other way to think about it is that this isn't the only way, only time I'm going to interact with this. In fact, I'm going to interact with it a lot over time. And I, over time, I'm going to like repeatedly come back to this resource. And therefore, it's not a transactional thing. It's not something I can walk away from. My contribution or my um, consumption at any one moment uh, isn't the problem. It's my contribution or my consumption over a long period of time. So like the really silly way to say this is like if you and I go get beer. If I take out like a, 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 a tab and I write down, Diane, I just paid five dollars for your beer. Put it away, and then and then we keep going. I, I, I just got you another round. That's so you now owe me ten dollars. That's mm -hmm. a transactional relationship, right? And and it's unlikely to create a trust system that allows us to kind of expand our network of trust. And there's also a whole set of ideas that say that trust is like a, is like a resource in itself, that organizations that have high trust can do things that organizations that have low trust can't do, right? Yeah, so absolutely, instead, yeah. Instead? Yeah, absolutely. Is, I, think, I think that's the nail on the head there, is that building the relationships um, with, with the trust factor embedded inside of communities. I mean, I think that's the goal of everyone like myself who does community development and tries to build com engaged communities around any ecosystem is that um, how do we ensure that there is trust? And that's where some of, some of the governance stuff comes in, but it's also about building um, the peer-to-peer -peer networks and the trust um, relationships um, inside yep. of that community. So yep. that's, that's quite nice. There's a couple of questions here in chat, um, and I, they might be, um, you know, so Mario Platt is asking, uh, uh, would you expect that, that team units would be building artifacts supporting all three economies, or would these, those ideally be distributed among many? Um, kind of Role-based thing, you know. Yeah. I do think, so here's my, my very short answer is that I think most organizations who don't have a platform team are going to have problems. Like there has to actually be people who own this space and who work with others to establish it, right? So uh, I do think that the three economies points away from conceptions like you run it, uh, sorry, you build it, you run it, and points towards conceptions like I build it, we run it. Um, in other words, there's a conception that I'm responsible for building a thing that is operable in all three economies. Um, it doesn't mean I have to operate it in all three economies, but that it, it responds to and understands enough about those other economic value systems that it doesn't frustrate them. So like one could argue like DevOps is simply the argument that people from efficiency economies should explain themselves better to people of differentiation economies so that people in differentiation economies understand 
how the way they write code is uh, creating value in, in an operation or not. Um, so operability, design for operability, design for manufacture, all these, these concepts. So yeah, I do think in enterprises, big, big enterprises, you're likely to see different, different, uh, I, I would almost su suggest in most organizations gonna be different VP level uh, structures for each of the economies and that those people will be, the VPs will be the people who need to be primarily driven to understand how to negotiate the differences between the economies. Hope that, that it gave you some light on that, Mario. Um, there's one more question here, and I'm going to go through the questions as they come in, and then we'll go back sure. and forth on some of the things that, that, that I am going to tease out. And if you can stay longer, please please do so. Um, uh, we'll, Absolutely. We'll, yeah. we'll hang out until until we run out of things to talk about. Um, Twitch loves that. Um, in, Barbara Frontera is asking, in most enterprise transformations I've seen, you run into some into the scalability wall at some point, whether it's legal, finance, et cetera. Can companies really overcome the paradox of variety? Ooh, that's a big one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I, so I do think that a lot of those walls, um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a great answer for that one. I, 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 um, I think that there's lots of things inside of organizations that are put there intentionally to kind of prevent uh, certain parts of the organization from growing too quickly and growing out of control. And I think that has, again, one of the ways to think about kind of common, common resource consumption, which, again, central IT is also concerned with, is that if the rate of change increases past the, the adaptive capacity of that part of the organization, it'll break the organization. So there's a limit on how quickly things can grow. Um, so again, kind of negotiating that and, and therefore, but one of the other parts of the three economies theory that I did not talk about here is, is how you invest variation across the organization. And one of the arguments is to say that if you can only scale so much, then you should be focused on scaling the right things and understand how to f determine what those things are and who creates value that will scale the fastest, right? Um, and so I, I would also point out just really quickly that I think what you're, the question is driven by questions about how to scale as opposed to scale economies. So one's about growth and one's about efficiency and there's, they're, they're the same term, but they're different ideas. So I think that I think we see uh, like in in the open shift commons and in the conversations that I have with people, there's there's an interesting thing, and this is different than enterprises. So we're talking about um, an an open source uh, community built out around the open shift um, ecosystem, which touches yep. on lots of open source projects, not just Kubernetes, but a bazillion other ones. And what we see is this huge um, amorphous software side of things. So like the, the stack of things that become OpenShift. And then there's the wild plethora or cornucopia of use cases of people who build applications on top of it. So like all the different use cases. And when we're, when I, and I'm just drawing this back to community development a little bit and the OpenShift Commons idea is that we want all, we want to support all of these different use cases. We want that yeah. wide, wide variety. Um, but what we have to do, and this is just conceptually slightly different, but what we have to do is make sure that our platform supports them, but then in uh, edge, not in terms of edge technology, but the edge cases too, uh, you know, we have to make sure that our platform, um, we don't go too far off to the edge to support some of the edge cases so that we don't lose some of the, the bigger loads here or we force some of the bigger loads or use cases on our platforms to um, to fail because you know we, yep. we, we've said that something else has to happen. So that that to me, there's there's a lot of commonality in what you're talking about with these three economies that apply to you know open source communities, um, which is why I'm, I'm so interested in this topic. Um, I, I think one of the things, and I'll just step back a little bit about OpenShift and tell a little context setting about OpenShift Commons. And so OpenShift Commons itself launched um, 
think almost four, maybe five years ago, um, when we pivoted from on the open and we're talking software here now, not not enterprises. When we pivoted from being a standalone platform as a service built on Ruby and Rails and MongoDB and all that goodness, um, to re replatforming it on Kubernetes. So what we did at that juncture is we joined this bigger community, this bigger software effort um, that Google open source Kubernetes, Red Hat jumped on board almost immediately and yeah. became part of that community, bringing along all of our end users and all of their workloads and all of their use cases and all of their enterprises and asking them to take the risk with us, to trust us, to move to that new platform. It turned out to be a really good bet, yep. which is great, but it also um, changed the way we did community um, and which is hence we needed to do something different than like oh please contribute it to my little github repo here or my ruby on rails or my whatever my installer process was back then or yeah we had gears and cartridges believe me we don't want to talk about them but um it changed our whole metaphor for community yeah um, and i think that was a really interesting tipping point for for me in terms yeah. of community engagement and community development because it no longer was about please, please, please contribute to my open source project. It was please, please, please contribute to the upstream here, contribute to the upstream there, give us your feedback, we'll contribute that to, you know. So it just changed the whole model, which caused us to have to rethink what community was. Yeah. And what and that's where, you know, back, you know, back four or five years ago, we started rereading the tragedy of the commons and all this stuff. We came up with um, or I, I really didn't want to start another foundation, yep. right? So I had this, um, and anyone who knows me knows that, you know, as much as I participate in a lot of foundations, I don't have a great love for them in terms of, um, them, you know, big tenting or whatever it is. There's, there's just a lot of politics involved there. And I, I personally didn't want to create yet another foundation. I think there's mm -hmm. a, uh, an acronym there. Um, so what we came up with was to take this, all this stuff around commons and to apply it to our community um, and make a common space for peers to come together, to share, to build some trust, to share stories, lessons learned, best practices, while still motivating people to contribute to all of these other open source projects and to give us the feedback so that we could successfully do that. And I think that has made all the difference for OpenShift. Um, and for um, Red Hat, um, because one, it applied some of the principles of things like the open organization that, um, that Whitehurst has um, really helped us move forward as a, a company. Uh, yep. And I think those kinds, we talk about transformations, that was a transformation for us. 100%. Making yep. the decisions to go to a commons model was huge. And um, it, we still struggle, you know, we still struggle with having enough, and I, this is why I brought up the people resource issue, is having enough people to um, engage with everybody successfully. But I, the trick, or what was it? Um, Kaiser Soze said the, the devil um, once, uh, how, how did that phrase go? Um, the, the trick the devil played was people never even realizing was there or some, yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. And that is the trick with the commons, I think, is that because it's become you, you'll, if you go into the common Slack or in the chat channels or anywhere, you'll see peers who are non-Red Hatters talking to other peers who are non-Red Hatters and exchanging best practices. That's the whole idea behind the gatherings and what we do there is to, yep. you know, because there is no better commercial for OpenShift than a customer standing up on stage and speaking the truth or their yep. truth. and. Yep. Um, or a customer or an end user or a developer in, you know, one of the upstream projects coming on and saying, oh, this is how Prometheus does this. And this is, you know, um, and, and please give us your feedback and we'll see if we can fix it or please join our. So facilitating those things, those are the kinds of um, toolings that I think, um, one, we, we're bringing open source methodologies to the commons, you know, so I, and our open organization um, practices that we have at Red Hat, so they're enterprise practices, but we're also um, really opening up the uh, uh, the gate. Um, we're giving away the podium. We're allowing um, peers to talk to each other without Red Hat in the middle. So it's there's an interesting thing when the, 
And I think that's what fits in the scale economy. That is the thing that makes commons, um, not just OpenShift common, but things that are commons or we, com we recommoned open source, basically yep. what, I'm, what I've been trying to do over the past three or four years. Whether I'm successful or not, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I still have do a lot of hand holding, and you know, and that's where the people stuff comes in. Is how do you scale that? And yep. I think some some of the uh, using other technologies like Slack or, uh, you know, all of all of the tooling that we have. So that that's yep. that's an interesting thing to tease out about what is recommoning. And like I think it's not what can open source teach us about recommoning. How can we recommon? open source yeah, is how I would cool. rephrase that, that, that question you're asking here is because I think open source has, I mean, you've got a little gray in your, your beard. Um, open source <laughs> has aged, whether it has aged well, um, it has changed to being something yep. that's very corporate entity driven. Yeah. Um, very much um, not where we were back in, you know, when I started back in DECAS and Digital Equipment Corporation days, because I got some gray hair here too. Um, it's, it's really, um, it's very much changed, but I think it still needs to change again. I think yeah. that we have to find a way <laughs> to make it not as gate, gatekeeping, so the control yeah. aspect that you talk about, um, yeah. which is on one side, and then, um, and have the wide variety and the scoping of open yeah. source and the way yeah. we do open source. It, so a lot of the principles you talk about applying this stuff to enterprises, I, on the other hand, want to apply it to open source and to the way we, we work. And, and, and it's not that I want to break foundations, it's that I want to change the whole model. Um, yep. And I think it has to in order for open source to really go to the, the true next level of yep. um, being able to scale both of those things. And we see constantly things breaking down. We always hit with the foundation model this tipping point, like we're like with OpenStack and its big tent model. And we're starting to touch on it with some of the stuff in the Linux Foundation, the CNC, CNCF. So. Mm -hmm. I want to have this ongoing conversation with you over the next couple of years or however long it takes about both bringing this three economies to enterprises as well mm -hmm. as to um, open source community development. So cool. That's I love that. I mean, uh, you know, I just, the, the importance of realizing that there's other ways of collaborating together is really critical. And I, you know, again, I, I like the idea, you know, of recommoning open source where, where it means like open source started as a commons and then was privatized and now needs to be recommoned. And in which ways has it been privatized and, and how is that working well or not? And, you know, I think it's super interesting to, to talk through those ideas. But, but I also think, again, you know, um, we can think about things like the reason why open source projects are successful is because uh, uh, or one of the questions I always have about open source projects that I think is interesting, one of the observations I always have is like, open source, the successful open source projects tend to be large infrastructural pieces, right? Like so you had databases, operating systems, platforms, right? They don't tend to be like little applications. They don't tend to be differentiation stuff, right? They tend to be big stuff. And part of that, I think, is just has to do with that you have, actually have to uh, create something that addresses a large enough audience of concern that you mm -hmm. can find enough people to support it because you're asking for small contributions at scale in order to create this space, right? Yeah. Um, so you get this weird thing where, like, the negotiations that you pointed to about, like, um, I want it to do this – versus we need it to do this, right? These kind of like edge cases versus core cases and things like that. All that stuff is part of the negotiation that I think is critical for large enterprises to understand. Because right now, the way that I generally see the, one of the big problems inside of enterprises that, that looks, that is at least fractally like what you just described, is lots of business units building something that is initially only valuable to them but eventually becomes valuable to other business units. And then they don't have anywhere to put it. 
Yeah. They don't have anywhere. They're either going to put it in the centralized IT department, which they believe will destroy the value of it and make it harder for them to use. Yep. Or they keep it for themselves. Um, and so they don't have a way of creating a community around a common resource. They don't know how to do that. Um, and so that's part of the transformation journey for me is to help them, uh, you know, and help other communities understand that certain things are only valuable when they're shared at scale or that they gain value by being shared at scale. Uh, and they don't get, the, the value doesn't go down, it goes up for everybody involved. Um, and that's the trick is to try to figure out how to get people to understand the economic rationality of that. And then my only last little, weird little comment is like, you, you were talking about like, we only have so many people, how do we deploy them? Well, economics is the study of rare resources applied to hard problems, right? That's the whole idea of value is rare resources being applied. And the question of, any economic rationality is how do we how do we apply that rare resources to get the most value in our economic frame and part of the importance of understanding the scope economy is to say that the other two economies literally destroy the value of the commons so we need to understand this other economic resource and this other economic rationality in order to deploy our the limited resources we have to create the most value we can Right, so that's that's the fun little weird part there's, of that. A, uh, ben, um, who I think is one of your colleagues, uh, at, had a comment in the chat. Is this a, he? He says, "I fear commoning commoning isn't a value commonly held. What behaviors <laughs> yes. do organizations start changing towards valuing recommoning?" And I would actually um, answer that quickly. That that one of the things that changed it for us within the OpenShift context was looking at it as an ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so when when we realized that we, we were more than just right, depending on this stuff or making a profit yeah. from this stuff, when we yep. changed our worldview or our paradigm to be more ecosystem focused, yep. that was something that then shifted everything at least Within our, within our organization um, and, and within the commons. And I think that's one thing, um, one behavior or way of thinking that changes things to be, to make people understand commoning as as a thing and recommoning. Right. So, there and are other people who go have ahead. other concerns. There are other people who have other concerns that are involved in the thing that I'm involved in. Yeah. And if we all optimize it for our personal concerns, none of us will get what we want. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So I think how do we negotiate the, that where we are basically volunteering to limit our extraction of the, the system in order to make sure that we can extract from the system? There's nothing wrong with profiting in, off of a commons. People do it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's whether or not that profit is sustainable and how the ecosystemic effects of that profit apply right and and that's exactly it it's it's that it's the economic sustainability of the system that we're looking for and the other thing i think that's really interesting and and this is where that jellyfish research comes into fact is the impact of our work and other people's work on each other that i think a lot of what happens in enterprises and that we aren't aware of our peers you know, That's and right. what they're doing and what the impact of what we're doing is on them and what, and they're not aware of what the impact of they are doing. So the more we can do, and this is where I go back to the ecosystem approach for community development. If people understand um, and figuring out ways to visualize, to, to surface that information yep. um, of how we are connected to other projects, um, like how when Open Tracing or Jaeger or some other project um, does a new release, how that filters down to the open tracing functionality that's built into OpenShift and Kubernetes, you know? Yep. So, and I think at a, a large scale, one of the, the, the things that we need to work on better, um, whether it's a, at CNCF and the foundations or Linux foundation or any of those folks or in the commons or, you know, just in general is building tools or ways of being you know, visually um, being notified, um, yep. connecting that because the first step for me has always been awareness of That's others. Right. 
right? And if Absolutely. you aren't aware of other people in your space um, or other use cases or whatever it is, same thing applies in an enterprise. If you aren't aware of what's going on in those other styles, and even at Red Hat, you've seen things like a product get released that has ripple effects on other people. And yeah, it's yeah. not even, you know, we are all open source, but, and we, you'd think we'd be good at this. <laughs> But every once in a while, someone will release something and you'll be like, holy crap, Ignition 3, you know, whatever. Yep. Um, yep. Those kinds of things. Right. I think that's, you know, like when we talk about like, I like using the concepts that people are exploring with observability to point out what you're talking about, right? Like one of the things about observability is to say like, how, how what conversations do we want to be having? What decisions do we want to be making? How can we make the system that we're managing together visible how do we get the data we need to make those decisions together so that everybody understands the decision because the data is presented in a way that makes sense to everybody well you know there's, there's a great set of literature around this idea that one of the things about commoning and recommoning is that um, in privatized systems or in centralized systems the decision structures and the data presentation can be narrowed because it can be narrowed to either address the private owner and or the governing body. But in commons, the data has to be presented in a way that everyone participating in the commons can all understand what the data means. And therefore we can make a decision together based on a common understanding of what the data means, right? So there's a whole set of like what observability does inside of a system and what, how you make things, things more visible. And then the other thing is like making things observable in a way that modifies the behavior of people participating in the commons so that, yeah. that, that you support the ability to maintain certain behaviors by showing people uh, and helping them understand what's happening. Um, and so I think exactly kind of like you were using the concept of visualizing, but like communicating this information across an ecosystem in a in a different way, frankly, than the like uh, hierarchy, you know, summar summarize up because that's not really what we're talking about here, and and that doesn't work particularly well. And it's also not necessarily about kind of addressing a governmental body who would give you like here's here's a standard sheet form for you to fill out to determine whether or not you are fitting best practice right now, and therefore are pre-approved to continue, right? Both of those are extreme opposites of the kind of type of interaction we want to point at, I think. Yeah, I think, I, I, and, and there's a lot of cheer, three cheers, you know, observability for the win and um, mm -hmm. good things in there. And, and like, I know one of the, and, and, and I, as much as I say things like, I must sound anti-foundation, I'm not. Like, I do a lot of work with the CMCF and all of the different projects there. And if you ever look at the landscape diagram for the, the CNCF. It's just chaotic and crazy. Um, there are so many projects and things at different levels. And um, even within, like, breaking down um, within Red Hat the barriers for everybody, not just upper management, but participants in different engineering projects and that, to see where all of their colleagues are touching points inside of that ecosystem. So if we break there's the OpenShift ecosystem, which is, expands well beyond just the CNCF stuff, but trying to um, create, you know, I hate to use the word dashboard, but a, a way that's open and transparent across just Red Hat. So this is an enterprise problem inside of Red Hat, is letting everybody know who is participating in the CNCF. We've got people working on all kinds of SIGs, all kinds of projects, and no one place where they can all go to see observe, shall we say, um, where um, their colleagues are at, you know, and where, you know, where there are resources from Red Hat alone. And I know that's not existing inside of CNCF in any way or is that, so there's this whole idea. And I think we are just at the very cusp of it. We are, it's what, it's not, what is this, this silly phrase? It's not what we um, know, but what we don't know, we know, or what we know, you know it's what we don't know that we don't know, right? It's the it's the physics of the thing, you know. It's like it's it's crazy, um, and until we can observe it, we really can't 
um, do much more. And I think we're only right now in the recommoning of open source or my efforts around open shift commons at the awareness level. We are aware that we don't know stuff. And that's, that's actually right. a good place to be because that makes us aware of um, the opportunities. So, Definitely. So uh, there's one other person who's just labeled guest who says, uh, much of this sounds like D. Hawk's ideas about chaotic organizations. Could that be correct? So uh, I, I think that there's there's probably some relation um, between this and chaotic systems to the extent that um, to the extent that DHOC is trying to point towards other forms of governance as potentially more optimal than kind of highly ordered structures, right? So. Um, so I, you know, he. I think he kind of maybe lays out what I would think of as kind of a a, a a gradient between highly, highly structured, highly ordered, ordered, highly hierarchical structures and anarchistic structures, um, and tries to point towards things like what what would eventually become holacracies and things like this. Um, and I think that's that's interesting. The the thing that I would point to that I'm not convinced not not sure enough about Dehawk having not really studied him particularly deeply, uh, I'm not sure that he shares what the three economies is saying in that the three economies model argues that all three different economic systems need to coexist. It's not we're not trying to replace. Uh, the other two economic systems, we're trying to mediate the other two by creating a third. Um, so, and, and that that's not true for all organizations. Like, I, I would assume that something like the OpenShift Commons needs to just be a commons. It doesn't need to have those other structures. Um, mm -hmm. But if you are a enterprise, uh, you do need to care about efficiencies, and you do need to care about differentiation and solve for those problems. And I think you can't do that effectively over a long period of time sustainably without creating this third economic paradigm inside your organization. And, and like, just like really quickly, one of the ways to think about this is that we've gotten really, really, really good at creating software quickly. Um, and that has created huge amounts of sprawl and redundancies inside of enterprises. And I mean, just go to any open source repository and there's like 16 different versions of the same project. Um, all, all owned and, and operated by different people trying to solve the same problem. Now, again, nothing inherently wrong with that, but in an enterprise there is, because that is uh, long-term maintenance of redundant functionality and data, uh, uh, siloing of different functionalities inside the organization. And frankly, a lot of politics happening between business units about ownership that are not productive or valuable for the organization. And therefore, if they had a way to rethink what it means uh, to own uh, a common resource, then they wouldn't necessarily need to have those conflicts because they would want to put as much of their stuff into the commons as possible once they had identified it as being commonly valuable. And then they would want other people to adopt it and, and accelerate the use of it because they would know that that would increase the likelihood of it being sustainable over a long period of time. So there. So there. So there. There's, so there. There's so much there there. So I, I think that we could probably do this every week, have this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I really think that I want to keep diving into some of this stuff with you um, on a regular basis and with Ben Great. and other folks and um, Barbara. Yes, I definitely will. I think this is really valuable um, and thought-provoking stuff um, because one, it informs me as I do the community development for OpenShift and um, as we bring these, what I try and do is um, you know, hopefully lead by example, but also um, to really be um, open to new ways of engaging with communities and building out platforms and um, tooling and whatever it takes to make this ecosystem live and breathe as you all are probably trying to do for your enterprises. And um, I think it's uh, not uh, it's not what you can do for open source 
or not what you can do for the enterprise. It's what we can do for each other. Um, and that I think is, is the crux of all of this. I think to me, I, and I will have to tease this out. And I think um, I'm going to have to digest everything we've talked about here today a little bit and watch this video again. But I, I kind of think that commons or what we're doing with OpenShift commons is that scale economy. It is that, it is that thing in the middle. That's and right. It doesn't get rid of either side. Um, That's right. And I think now if I understand things correctly, what we're doing is, you know, and in these conversations is flushing out how to scale the scale economy and That's how right. to build that space to be effective. And, and that I think is a great thing to keep doing. So um, on that, I'm going to bring this to a close because we've gone over 20 minutes and um, if any of you are listening, want to be part of this conversation or have some theories or practice or, you know, lessons learned doing this kind of um, transformation within your organizations, please reach out to Jabe or myself um, at um, commons.openshift.org. You can join the transformation SIG. I don't think it's on the home page yet. I think I still have to do that, but um, I will shortly. Um, just reach out to us. You can find us on Twitter and we will definitely give away the podium. That is my whole shtick in life. Um, as much as you think that I like to talk, I don't even like the sound of my own voice. I'd much rather hear Jabe talk. So thank you all for joining us today. And um, again, this will all be uploaded on YouTube and available on Twitch TV to listen to in your leisure. And to go back, make sure everybody's bedtime story is stone soup. Please go get a copy from the library, go buy a copy, whatever it is, um, just find it and read it. It is the book I grew up with, uh, and I think it really formed the basis of uh, free open source Diane, um, how things go.